Hey everyone, welcome to Unicast's new episode. My name is Samriti Sahagal, and today I have the honor of hosting Ashish Mehrotra, the CEO and Managing Director at Max Bupa, India. Mr. Mehrotra is a leader in the realm of finance with over 20 years of experience in retail and commercial banking at City India, where he rose to be the country's head and Managing Director. Today, he's CEO at one of India's largest insurers, leading the group in India's hyper-competitive insurance market during what is said to be one of the toughest economic climates in the last few decades. In today's episode, Ms. Amarotra gives us his opinions on job hopping, the impact of COVID on both the healthcare and the banking sector, the importance of mentorship, and how to overcome professional barriers. So without further ado, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Hello, sir, welcome to Unicast. It's great to have you. Thank you, Smriti. It's uh, great to be connecting with you. So, um, Actually, like you already know, the first segment is going to be a little about, uh, you know, the last few months in quarantine and lockdown and, you know, your advice to students on how they should be working on skills. So um, I'll just start off this segment by asking you how your routine's been for the last few months and what like you've been doing for the last few days. I think, uh, you know, while as we all grappling with this uh, pandemic situation, uh, clearly, the personal routine has become far more hectic. There is a little bit of, uh, or actually no borderline between the weekdays uh, and the weekends. But I think what I find uh, really challenging and, you know, something we've not been coped over the years, uh, <clears throat> while I think to some extent I've been lucky in my many roles, uh, I've been based out of Bombay, my team been based all over, uh, all over the country and so on and so forth. But uh, <clears throat> How do you keep the motivation level and the engagement level of the employees, the people who are working, who you are working with, uh, becomes a, a truly a challenge because that personal touch, chatting over a coffee, uh, is kind of missing, uh, or walking around uh, in the office and going to someone's desk is no longer there. Uh, but I guess uh, you know one one needs to be far more mindful uh, that the people who are working from home have a their own set of challenges and you as a leader need to ensure uh, you are able to recognize and have a lot more empathy uh, when, when working with colleagues because everybody may not have the same amenities uh, or a separate study or a separate uh, room. Uh, so I think some of those issues uh, I, I, find of, uh, I find on the people side, on the softer side, far more challenging and I think if you look back uh, or you look forward saying this is not going to become a new novel. Uh, but clearly, large amount of leaders or the managers of the world today have to equip themselves with some of these skill sets. But I think one on coming back to your core point on a personal question, I think there is two things which is paramount. Uh, one, you know, I I had a uh, large part of my experience has been on the lending side, so I kind of relate to what's happening today in 2007, 8, 9 uh, credit crisis uh, and what be the aftermath once the world turns to normal, in the new normal world. Uh, so you are living in one in hundred year scenario. Uh, and one thing which is which is pretty clear uh, if one uh, looks forward is that your ability, your success in future will be determined by your ability to unlearn and relearn the new ways of doing business. Uh, to me, that's the one single takeaway. Uh, and all of us, uh, and some of us who are who've been used to a conventional model of working in terms of dealing with people and so on and so forth, uh, we'll have to find a way to reinvent ourselves. That's my personal take here. Okay, that's actually great to hear. Now, I wanted to ask you, do you think that in the world of retail banking, there's sort of any particular skills that students uh, should um, plan on, you know, taking up and maybe using this time wisely to work on anything that sort of helped you in your journey? Uh, clearly, uh, I think my career in banking uh, just kind of span across over 20 odd years uh, um, and with stint in India and some of the stints in uh, other markets. 
uh, clearly my last job was running the retail bank for city in india uh, i think i followed three operating principles uh, which to my mind uh, work for me uh, you know those principles now need to be reinvented in the normal world uh, one was uh, we've seen a massive surge of the retail banking as the consumerization in india grew uh, and i think that's happening around the uh, around the globe the power of the middle class in india uh, it's exponentially expanded over the last two decades it's there in our in our consumption patterns and our spend patterns it's all related uh, my personal take was uh, three key operating principles and uh, more so for your career and banking and finance uh, these are highly regulated industries and uh, one was upfront your mistakes we all going to make mistakes uh, and we must have front it uh, when you are front it your supervisor your colleagues come around to help you in solving that mistakes and if you don't do it and you shove it under the carpet one day that will come up and somebody will come and tell you you are a mistake uh, i think that's the one piece because and that comes from open transparent uh, <coughs> way of working the second piece uh, is being uh, don't be hero for a day uh, to me uh, you know you take analogy from cricket or you take any of those metaphors that are uh you know one would like the career is built over a long period of time so attitude becomes far more relevant than your any other skill set uh, so don't be tempted to do a deal because you think that deal will make you a star for that month for that day for that year uh it builds over a long period of time if it's not done rightfully uh so you know career is built over a long period of time don't fall into temptation of doing things which may not be right by the organizational values uh, and uh, you may not be walking the talk in terms of values and the governance compliance and ethics it's, it's very good the third is uh, we all going to work in teams uh, correct uh, and that's that's very important that you have trust faith and open culture uh, but your signatures and your consent is equally important uh, when you put your pen on paper uh, on a transaction or something else it is your approval your consent for that transaction hence uh, i always encourage people to trust but verify uh, you know this is more so because of what i have experienced around and we've seen around both in the lending businesses and in the wealth management businesses of the bank uh, that people fall into some of these traps uh, and end up uh, you know putting a massive full stop to their uh, so called fast Uh, career so that's my core three operating principles uh, uh which i kind of tell to people can i everybody has the right level of att- uh, attitude uh, openness and enthusiasm and an obsession uh, for growth uh, and I'm, i think that's given uh, but falling into some of these traps can actually put a massive bit out to your career i look at my own career i moved around many functions and some of those functions which i went to do for me it was also like swimming in the uh, in the midst of the arabian sea for the very first time uh, but there was trust there was confidence and there was a faith the people had in me uh, but i needed to apply my own learning uh, to embrace and build my career around those things So, sir, you have mentioned a lot of the soft skills you need, I believe. But do you think there's also some sort of technical skill that's required in this field, or is it sort of, you know, anything? You know, I think my, uh, you know, and more so from the from the from the leadership perspective, uh, you know, technical skills. I think there is there are few things. One, and I think the one most important thing one must do is to look into the mirror, not because. one wants to look good but to see am i really exciting for my team and i do i really walk the value of the organization the second thing to my mind if you want to pursue the career in in retail or anything to do with in consumer uh, i think one has to be obsessed uh, with the customer experience uh, you know if you look at it strategically you know there are three or four key strategies around which businesses are built I want us to play it on scale. Second is to play it on price. Uh, third is to play on the innovation. But all of that in the financial services industry, there would be somebody else who will have a better funding or a better capital 
uh, funds to deploy to build size and scale. There will be always somebody else who will be able to produce goods cheaper than you. Uh, there will be always somebody else who will innovate. The innovation in the financial services industry is a function of how nimble footed your competition's technology platform is, the products can be copied. The value proposition of cards, the value proposition on the segment can be copied and replicated. Uh, but the core determinant is is around how you treat your customers and that comes with the culture you build around in your team and, your, uh, and that is a long-term sustainable advantage uh, which you create for your uh, uh, for the for the franchise you represent you know and I, if you look at it today's scenario i about four years five years ago i moved to run uh, max Bupa. it's a large Bupa was a large uk base uh, medical uh, company, uh, they are 70% of their revenues to come from the insurance business, 30% is to come between, uh, between the aged care, dental uh, and senior living, uh, but they are specialist medical insurance company and they had a, we had a joint venture here in India with Max India, uh, which is a large $3-4 $4 billion group uh, in India and uh, our core piece was saying, I think we, we had people who were bigger than us in the market, people who had a bigger distribution than us, people who were doing products far more. Uh, and we said, we're going to be obsessed with the customer experience and the outcomes that we have uh, were significantly better. Um, and I think uh, that's where it is. Uh, and when I was staying, and we said, we will build digital capabilities because that was core to our strategy. A strategy when I came in, we said we put the strategy as a simple ABCD. We want to be the provider of choice to the urban affluent uh, Indians living in cities because that's our distribution network was. The second was that we will broad base a franchise through a strategic tie with banks and digital companies and so on and so forth. The C stood for customer centricity. I think everything around us has to be around customers and how do we genuinely make this or our life superior because he or she has a maximum of all here, correct? Uh, and that's also comes the cost consciousness and the compliance to the laws. Uh, D was digital, uh, saying we want to be a completely digital company over the period of few times. And when we hit, when the pandemic hit us, uh, it shows that our risk management practices and the stuff around it did in digital really stood the true test of us. Our service standards, our ability to process people's claims uh, did not see any blip or saw a minor blip for a couple of days, but we were close to 95, 96% to our service standard. This means initial period of the first few, first phase of the lockdown, we were still able to deliver and to serve our customers very close to the standards we had set for ourselves. And those are like really high standards. Uh, that means at various points in time in the career in five years or four and a half years with Max Pupa, when we were evaluating this thing, what could go wrong and what we should build in future, uh, for future, not that we were aware that something like this could happen, but you prepared yourself to the uncertainty. And, and that really, uh, that really helped us. Wow. That's great to hear, sir. And I think this segment was really insightful on your end on a lot about how you've been, you know, your work ethic and how you've been working, um, you know, every day during this busy, unprecedented time. So thank you so much for this uh, segment. And I will call you back in a few hours for the next segment. Hello, sir. Welcome back. I hope your day was well. Yeah, thank you very much. Very well. Um, so I wanted to dive into the second segment and I wanted to um, talk a little more about your professional journey. So I wanted to start by asking you, uh, given you know your extensive role again in retail banking you mentioned in the previous segment, and especially in a country like India, you know, which has so much diversity, what was your most sort of difficult experience? Uh, taking into consideration the cultural barriers between you and a client and you know, how did you sort of work upon that and uh, overcome that obstacle? 
I think uh, to a couple of uh, couple of things more so uh, not only in India but also when we were doing something in Poland or in uh, Thailand or in Singapore and stuff like that but more so in India uh, you know I thought one thing is very very clear uh, that you need to create a value proposition which is relevant for the for the end consumer uh, and uh, and we, we kind of when we looked at it across board especially more so on the retail part um you know just segmenting it right for the for the value uh, uh which you want to offer to the end consumer as part of the offering uh, becomes the core determinant of the customer loyalty and the customer uh, customer experience uh hence i think the core uh, of it is to get the right target client model uh, this means who your target market is and and are you designing the appropriate product for that target market and how do you ensure uh those products are getting delivered that means trying to own the micro moments uh, uh of the experience which customer has because end of the day you may, may or may not be controlling uh the real moment of uh moment of sale when a customer uh is getting sold a product in his house uh, or in his office or somewhere outside or in a mall or so forth and so forth uh but owning those micro moments actually determines uh the customer satisfaction and the customer loyalty to the product I think those become far more challenges because you know India is a fairly large, diverse geography. Uh, you know there is a language barrier. Uh, every uh, 200 kilometers is a different language. There are different value systems around it. Uh, so to ensure that consistency of the brand promise getting delivered across the length and breadth of the country becomes uh, uh, becomes a bit of a challenge. Uh, but as long as you put the systems, processes, and controls around in it, and you are an an obsessed uh, with customer centricity and the customer experience, you more often than not you will get it right. Okay, uh, that's interesting to hear on your answer. Um, sort of, uh, you know, connecting that again back to city. Um, you started your career and you devoted almost twenty years to city before you joined Max Bupa as CEO. So, do you have any advice or insights or, you know, anything you want to talk about? Um, how you feel um you know what are the prospects of job hopping and are there any benefits to it are there any pros cons what about it so on my 25 years of career i only worked for two organizations my 26 years we only worked for two organizations i had a beautiful time in city uh, uh like i said in the, in the previous segment every 3 years or two and a half three years i got to do something very different uh, some of them were a natural extension but i also got the opportunity to set up de novo businesses for the bank in india for the very first time the functions which got replicated around the asian countries and asian markets uh, at the same time and you know once you did that successfully you got wanted to run very large and complex businesses uh, and that's been a very very exciting journey i don't think i would trade off anything uh, for that uh, and it's been very richly rewarding in terms of my learning and experience Uh, it's been a phenomenal journey, and so is the journey with the Max Group from the time I came in uh, to the transformation of the company, making it the most preferred brand in the uh, India's hyper-competitive marketplace on the insurance side, uh, and then finding the uh, rightful buyer and ensuring the seamless transition to the shareholders. Uh, and now I'm working towards setting up a you know, fintech venture. Uh, so let's see what happens. That's very interesting, actually. Um, I also actually wanted to ask you: Do you think there was a benefit of you being so loyal to one firm? And you know, is there any way that really helped you shape your career path? And oh, it's, it's really, like I said, it's been a uh, it's been a great learning experience, and I won't trade off uh, anything or any year out of that, uh, saying you know I should have left in fourteenth year, fifteenth year. And my reason for leaving was also not because of anything. else but uh, i wanted to be in india my mother used to live with me and you know if you come from indian value system if you are the only son uh, you know i i was very clear <laughs> and there's a the next job and was way way uh, time off and i didn't wanted to do any more parallel job and i thought health and the bupa's purpose of ensuring customer be healthy and happy and long and life kind of resonated with me uh and you know the insurance market in india was what the retail of the consumer banking was uh in early 90s uh, so it looked 
the right thing for me to do and to test myself for what I have learned across so many years in city and says can I successfully transform the company uh, and I thought uh, it's, it paid off really well so uh, you know my advice it's always great to have a good career with a large company over a long period of time that you every two years look for a employment I'm sure uh, you know as a, as a CEO the way I looked at the talent pool I always looked at it saying how long people has been doing their job and how soon can we take more risk on them and push them to do the next level of job and how do we rotate people uh, because one you always waste need is in a company or any organization is a diversity of thought and empowering your people uh, to go and chase uh, their dreams uh, correct as a CEO I'll be the most happy when some of the decisions are being made without I being aware this means that the people have embraced the value and people are now feeling a lot more confident to go and do what needs to be done uh, for the for the company and so you know if you are able to find that kind of mix um, you know continue to be wherever you join and I'm sure you guys all of you will have a great career ahead okay thank you for that sir and just my last question for this segment is um, did you ever have a mentor um, along your professional path and do you think it was helpful to have one or do you recommend that students should find one strongly recommend uh, and I think we must understand the difference between the mentor and the coach uh, and I had both uh, you know many for the initial period of time in city uh, because we had spent not a long time uh, and every two, three years I got to do something new. So obviously there were many mentors who helped shape my career, who helped shape my learning. Uh, and those people were truly, uh, truly, uh, they did it without anything uh, for me. Their, their core interest was in my success and the success of the organization. So, you know, I had a great mentors within the city system itself. A lot of them happen to be my bosses and ex-bosses and so on and so forth. Uh, and I also had a coach and some part in time when you needed to reflect back uh, on how to deal, uh, especially when I moved into Dubai and I said, listen, I need to have a coach because you know managing a board of a joint venture in India where the shareholders may have different priorities. Uh, you know, it's good to have it. So, you know, just go seek out asking for an advice, asking you know, just discussing openly your issues, concerns, uh, opportunities, how should you deal with some of these people related sensitive decision, how should it, you know, you should position your point of view to the board, how would you like to get uh, some of the things done. Uh, you know, it's important to have these conversations. I will, I will encourage. And actually, there is one more thing we did. Uh, which is, you might, you might find it a little bit amusing, but somewhere in 2014-15, I went to someone saying, I'd like to have a reverse mentor. Uh, and he said, what? He said, you know, now I have so much of young pool of talent who are in 20s, in their uh, mid-20s, uh, to manage them uh, and to, I want to understand what really excites so that city or the Max Cooper continues to be the place of choice because you know, as you look at evolution, times have changed to the question, you know, you're asking me, should I two years from now look for a second job? Uh, so I actually also got a reverse mentor. And I got one of the young kids to, to interact with me to tell, saying what are the challenges he she is facing and what can be done uh, and how should leaders uh, look at them and how should leaders engage with this young pool of talent, of young pool of millennials which is coming into workforce. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a great thing. It mentors and the coaches also learn. And so does, uh, so I would encourage you guys to have that conversation, go around, uh, always seek, always seek help. Okay, I think, yeah, definitely. This is something that we've heard from a lot of, you know, CEOs and again, you're ratifying it. So that definitely means that it's important. So I think that would uh, be really helpful for our audience. So with that, uh, we come to the end of the second segment. Uh, thank you so much, sir. And I will call you back for the third segment. Sir, welcome to our last segment for the day. Thank you so much once more. 
So um, this last segment is going to be more to do with uh, sort of your insights and opinions on a lot of um, uh, you know topics related to banking or the insurance sector. So um, I'll start off by asking, uh, in your opinion, what do you think has been the biggest change in retail banking uh, since you know you started your career? versus people entering the specific sector today and has there been a change in the skill sets that's required from employees? Uh, obviously, I think that some of the biggest changes consumers are far more involved than what they were 20 years ago. Uh, hence, to the point which I said earlier, uh, you know, clearly defining the value proposition of the product in a very simplistic manner has become far more important and do not uh, and that's becoming core uh, because customers today you have multiple platforms for customers to compare products hence more clearly uh, the retail banking products or the insurance products or any other products that clearly articulates the value proposition price points becomes far more uh, far more critical uh, the big piece is uh, you know we spoke about earlier unlearning and relearning and the second important thing in today's age everybody should know is coding uh, today is we are living in a digital age uh, i think the current pandemic situation has fast tracked the digital consumption to my mind by minimum 10 years if you look at it the behavioral change from february march this year to today in uh, on 31st of July, you will see the behavioral pattern across the society, across the age groups have changed dramatically on digitally buying goods and services. Uh, that means uh, the, the products have to be become far more simpler uh, and digital uh, is, the, is, the, is now here for us to embrace and to build around on it. Uh, and I think those skill sets are very important. Uh, but there is one thing which is genuinely important and irrespective of whatever you want to do. So I spoke about unlearning and relearning with things, coding. Uh, is that your obsessions with about delivering the right experience to your end customers, whether on a physical world, digital world, or physical world. And I think these three worlds will exist now uh, for a period of time. And you look at it across the customer life stages, uh, depending on how do you attract customers, how do you connect with the customers, how do you engage with the customers, how do you fulfill their needs, and how do you deepen relationship across the spectrum of the customer life cycle with the company or with the product. Uh, you know, these three stages will continue. Uh, hence, uh, your obsession towards customer experience. And I, would, I encourage everyone in my team and to young ones, to all of you, find a time in a week where you can say how what we did last week and is there a better way of doing it correct simplification to my mind is the most important virtue one needs to find say how do i simplify the delivery of the product how do i simplify the literature of the product but I mean, how do i write the insurance contract or the banking contract in a manner that my mother can read and understand I think the simplification to my mind is the most underrated virtue and I think that's something which will determine the future course uh, around uh, for us to be successful in this new age of digital world. Uh, okay, okay. Um, so, um, again, just a little um, opinion based in the healthcare sector now, actually the health insurance industry. Um, do you think that um, you again expect any changes uh, in this industry, especially considering you know the COVID crisis at hand? Do you foresee any uh, regulatory you know changes in the near future? I think uh, you know Indian regulation over the years uh, have uh, across all three regulation regulators in India, whether it's the Reserve Bank of India, whether it's the Capital Markets Regulator, the SEBI, or whether it's the insurance regulator in India over the last few years have done so much of work to ensure uh, uh, protection of the end customer's interest uh, towards driving simplification uh, and towards uh, ensuring uh, uh, you know the right products are being sold to the right customers. So the regulation is more about empowering customers and I think those are the steps in the right direction. Uh, we, uh, we last year in the insurance regulator also uh, rolled out sandbox. We created a bunch of new products around the regulatory sandbox. This means they are also encouraging innovation 
Uh, I think what's going to happen around uh, my view is if I were to do a little bit of history raising, which genuinely the tailwinds uh, towards the demand of the medical insurance have gone up. Uh, India unfortunately had a, a private medical insurance penetration of less than 5%. Can I put some of those in the low single digit? It's about 4.5%. The overall insurance penetration would be 18 22%. But, but the PMI uh, uh, penetration was uh, below, uh, uh, below uh, around 5% or so. I think now we've seen a massive increase in demand because it's no longer about do I need to know have the medical insurance? Uh, then it moved to what kind of medical insurance do I need to have and now when can I get it because I think now I, have, I need to have it now. I think that's the that's a big piece. It's to my mind it's the best risk cover one needs to buy whether anything else when bought or not. Medical insurance needs to be purchased by everyone. That's the one part. I think that globally there's one other piece which will come into play is that in some of the Europeans in the, the, the American markets is that some of these pandemic situations are not covered under the insurance contract. Uh, hence, uh, you know, uh, you know, simplification of those contracts and how do you ensure some of these things get covered uh, uh, will become uh, an important intervention by the regulator of those markets. But luckily for us in India, this is covered for all our indemnity products. Hence, as long as you have to cover, uh, one will uh, one will get benefit of claims processing around them. Okay. Um, and sir, I wanted to actually also sort of compare India to China um, and sort of um, understand from your end, you know, there have been a lot of financial uh, commentators who look at China and they talk about the growing one trillion consumer lending bubble. So do you think that India might um, be moving forward uh, towards something similar or, uh, you know, we're still a couple of years of I think we have a few years behind, uh, but if you look at it, uh, you know, over the last few years, over the last two decades, uh, uh, you know, India consumer lending markets every five years has been uh, been doubling, correct, to about 48 lakh crores. Uh, that's the total consumer lending uh, sometime uh, last year and around that's the time. And it's projected to double again to about 96 lakh crores. Uh, I think that's going to happen. While we will see, you know, to my mind, six quarters or if not more of six to eight quarters of little bit of slowdown around in that space because clearly um, the small businesses have been impacted, large businesses have been impacted pretty adversely uh, in, the, in the current pandemic situation. So you've seen that the incomes levels have shrunk more. Hence you're also seeing the slowdown in the consumption patterns. Uh, Correct. The bureau scores have now been ratified because the Indian regulators has extended the moratorium period till July or so. Uh, you know, I think when the rubber hits the road in August, September, and that's when you will see a little bit of challenges with the consumers' uh, income levels being, uh, being uh, the, the shrinkage uh, or the contraction in the con consumers' uh, income uh, and the spend pattern changing. So I think we are in for a little bit of tough time. Uh, around the lending businesses to my mind. There will be a lot more focus on optimization of debt uh, rather than looking for new debt. Uh, so I see a little bit of slowdown on consumption for the next few, uh, mm -hmm. uh, for the next year, year or so in India particularly, uh, correct? Uh, so unlike in other markets in Hong Kong where the regulator has put money in your wallet in some of the other countries. Uh, US also the regulator has put money in your wallet so that the consumption continues. That hasn't happened there. Uh, we even showed that we eased out the borrowers uh, uh, in a way that gives them sufficient time for them to uh, pay their debt. Uh, so I see a little bit of contraction for the next uh, six to eight quarters but after that it will bound to uh, come back to the growth trajectory it was having earlier. Uh, so, you know, that's my take on the Indian market today on the lending side. Okay, okay, sir. That was a really interesting take on from your side. And just my sort of last question to wrap um, this up. Um, so, you know, in other hyper competitive markets in India, many firms have sort of re resorted to the money burning uh, predatory antics to stay ahead of the competition. So, how does Max Bupa, you feel, itself in the health insurance industry and you know as a leader uh, what were the changes that you introduced to ensure that Max Bupa can remain ahead of the curve? 
Uh, you know, actually, I, I I walked into Max Cooper at a, at a point in time that I, when the shareholders had bought uh, an inordinately large amount of capital for a very small revenue. For every hundred dollars they spend, they add only thirty dollar of revenue. Let me put it in that sense. In the past six years of the company. Uh, so my uh, I I looked at it saying, what's the core strength of the company? Uh, and we did a very detailed assessment as part of a planning process and says how do we build on the strength and what we need to do uh, over a period of time that we are able to create uh, a greater value for the customers and for our shareholders. Uh, <clears throat> and that's where the strategy of ABCD uh, came into play which I spoke about in the earlier segment. Uh, and since some of you may be studying marketing and you know we spoke about earlier in lending stuff a concept called target client model. Uh, to me that was very clear uh, and I want to take a couple of minutes to explain to you why it's so very important. Uh, you know we, we designed the products in the company uh, for, for an affluent uh, Indian. Uh, when the products were but the same value of the products were getting sold uh, for people in the lower uh, or in the emerging affluent income banks, uh, correct, and a, and a smaller ticket size the medical insurance. This means the benefits and the cost structure to deliver the benefits were designed uh, for a very different risk cover than what was really happening uh, uh, and then the, then the customers we were acquiring. Uh, so when you looked at it, as a consequence of that, you had a claim cost of about 75-76%, uh, you know, you had a much higher claim cost. The cost of acquisitions was high, the net embedded value was relatively uh, very, very low. And we were uh, posed with a question saying, how do we get out of this curve? Uh, so we had to redesign uh, our entire portfolio of product, which maybe in the history of an insurance was done for the very first time that we, I had to reprice all our products. Our marquee product called Heartbeat got repriced by about 29%. A 29% price increase on Indian con from an Indian market perspective, uh, it's a very high price increase uh, because uh, you know India is Indian by and large are the value seekers. Uh, you know, so we went about doing lots and lots of work, and we said, how do we ensure that this price increase does not have a negative connotation among our customers? In the insurance business, you know, it's an annual contract. I sell you an insurance, the contract will come up for renewals, same month, same date, next year. You can choose to be with me or you can choose to take that contract and go to the next company. And, and if you decide to go, you know, I spend $150 to get a $100 of revenue in year one. And if year two, you're not there with me, I've lost the full uh, piece. So we, we went around and, you know, putting a strategy to the real execution. We said, how do we create a very differentiated customer value proposition? Uh, and we spoke about micro movements, uh, owning the true movement uh, for the end consumers. Uh, and we said the true movement for the end consumer is when he or she uh, uh, goes to the hospital for the medical uh, care. Uh, and we said, let's own it. So we went uh, three years ago uh, to the uh, to the international to the to the press and to the media and to massive advertising, saying 30 minutes cashless claim. Uh, you know, obviously there was massive conversation disagreements within the team, uh, including at the board saying, "Are you sure you want to make a promise? Will you be able to deliver?" And I had to, and I stood up and said, "I think at any point in time we will live up to 95 percent of these. We will be able to deliver." And I had to redo processes. You know, rolling up your sleeves, trying to understand when the application comes, what happens, what happens if hospital doesn't send you the detailed invoice and so on and so forth. We went about doing it. We went to the national media with it. Then we also said, how do we create, then we found slew of hospitals where we thought large number of customers were visiting. And we said, we'll create a point of care desk there so that they can feel and touch the Max Bupa brand. We have our representative who will ensure they get seamless admission, they get seamless discharge, their experience in the hospital is good. I don't determine the experience in the hospital, I hope the care is right. But as for us, two things of admission and discharge, which is a big part of the insurance uh, 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 process we were planning to own. So we did slew of such stuff, value proposition, which was truly relevant 
not putting bells and whistles not not only trying to put a health coach putting giving you telemedicine and so on so forth. those were also done in the product but this to me were the benefits which customers could feel and touch uh and some of them worked for us beautifully because it gave our brand uh, the top of the mind recall uh with the, with not as much spend as than some of my peers were doing uh and also uh, you know some of the stuff which we created whether we created any time health machine to complement it's like an atm machine you go it does your uh little bit of your medical check and you can buy the insurance cover and walk out in like less than a minute or so Uh, so all of that created a touch and feel uh, around the brand and what Max Cooper stood for, and we had then had the 30% uh, price increase. When I said 30% price increase in the markets like Delhi, Bombay, which is where the healthcare cost is very high, the price increase could have been as much as 20, as much as 45, 50%. In some of the other markets where the health cost was low, the price increase was much lower. So I'm talking averages at 29%. uh but as a consequence of that if you look back over two years what happened because the entire price increase process runs when the app when the contracts are coming up uh on their anniversary correct when the contracts are coming up for renewal uh so at the end of it our persistency the customer loyalty went up from 76 to 90 percent uh uh correct in spite of 30 percent 29 percent price increase our claim cost eventually came down because we got the target client model right uh and overall you know profitability started looking much better than what it was so you know that's why when you when you learn some of these concepts this is what is so very relevant for you when you go in front of any of the consumer businesses because as long as you got the target client model right you get everything around on it right this means your value proposition your delivery channels your experience parameters and how do you manage them through the cycle we spoke about cycle uh, i think so that was a good piece uh, for us to learn at saying your obsession with customer centricity really translating into tangible values and paying back to the company far more richly than trying to do anything which was more of bells and whistles uh, and just the media uh, uh, so you know i think that means purpose with which uh it's very important saying what's the purpose of what you're trying to do and our purpose was healthier uh and happier lives uh so we said everything we're going to do uh to to for our customers it should be leading towards healthier and more happier lives okay thank you sir that was really eye opening it was really interesting to hear how you do things on your end and you know get a glimpse of your work ethic so um i think with that we come to the end of um our interview thank you so much for this conversation i had a lot of uh, you know fun understanding how you work and it was really engaging so thank you once again and i hope to connect with you soon thank you thank you cheers bye and with that we come to the end of today's episode If you enjoyed today's interview, don't forget to like, share and subscribe to Unicast's YouTube channel. Thank you and we'll see you next. Time.